So Judy has loaned me her Bible because what I had printed was a little bit different. So I hope we, what I read will be what you read. <laughs> now in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have, have, been, have to be factions among you, for only so it will become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I have received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. <clears throat> and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's eat. Thank you. Let's eat. That's what I used to hear every night. We would be out playing on these nice summer evenings. We would be doing what kids do in the summer. And mom and dad would be doing what moms and dads do. My dad would normally be out. He's a school teacher, so he'd be out in the garden working in the summer. My mom was doing things that moms do. And when it was time for supper, they would ring the cowbell. Yeah, a cowbell out the door. And we would come running and we wash our hands and we sit around the table. And all the hot steaming food would be there, ready to go. We'd smell it. So it would be ready to just jump right in. We'd say grace. And then we'd say, let's eat. And we would start eating and we would eat and we'd chatter and we'd hear about each other's days. The weirdest thing was when I met my husband, I would go up to Grand Rapids with his family and my husband is so wonderful and his family is so wonderful. I love them very much. And I went and I would sit down at their table and I was waiting for those familiar words, let's eat. And they didn't do that. They said grace and then they ate in silence. And that's just what they do. And then after, after a meal, they would talk and talk and talk. And, and sometimes hours into the night, they sit around the kitchen table talking about their day and about politics and about religion and about all those things you're not supposed to talk about. Now, it was informal and we would share our days. And no matter how we do it, eating is really important part of our life. As we gather around the table and we break bread and we drink and we share our lives together. And so it was in the early church. The early church was just like that. I was really surprised to hear that communion was like that in the early church, sitting around the table, communing and getting to know one another very informally. I read a book this last week by Mike Graves. He's a pro professor at St. Paul's Seminary, and the book is called Table Talk, Rethinking Communion. And what I learned from that was that he wrote it while he was on sabbatical, and one day he was out with a bunch of buddies on the golf course. And he was talking about his book. They asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm kind of working on this book on communion. And he said, and he was telling them all about it. And, and then he stopped because they were so curious about what he was doing. Kind of surprising, isn't it? But he asked them this question. What's it like in your church? What's the mood like in your church when you celebrate communion together? And there was a long silence. And then one of the guys said, well, you know, people come up and, they, and they're very somber, they're very respectful, they're quiet. We break off of the priest of the bread and we dip it into the cup. And, and it's just very, very subdued. It's lower, they lower the lights 
and there's usually some sad organ music playing. <laughs> Just ready for that, Andrew? And, and then the other, and, and, he's, and, and Andrew's got it. Um, and then one guy said, yeah, it's kind of like going to a funeral. And the interesting thing is that in the early church, communion was not like a funeral. If you turn in the book of Acts, Acts 2 talks about what Christians did in the early church, how they lived together. And it says that they, they spent time doing four things. And the first thing was that they, they shared and learned what the teachings of the apostles, the teachings of Jesus, like our disciple Bible study class does. And they spent time in fellowship. And, and that wasn't pie along the, in fellowship hall. That was sitting down and really doing life together, really sharing their lives, their joys, their concerns, their struggles. And then the third thing is that they broke bread together and they shared the cup. And they shared communion with one another on a regular basis. And then it says the fourth thing is that they said daily prayers. They did pr daily prayer together so that they could pray for one another and support and encourage each other on the journey of faith. So it's interesting to know that they sort of had this communal life together that was filled with celebration and joy and sharing life together. And communion really for them was much more like a dinner party, a celebratory dinner party. Now, I don't know about you, but my dinner parties at my house are not like funerals. <laughs> Usually we gather our friends together and I can hardly wait for this summer because um, we are building a deck on the back of our town home. And Lindy and I just were talking last week about what fun it will be to, to invite our friends over to the house and, and to have them come for dinner and, and we'll have lots and lots of food and, and we will have some tasty beverages. Yes, pastors have tasty beverages. <laughs> And we will share conversation. My husband's a great jazz musician. He'll play the piano. We'll put some jazz music on. It'll be a party. Some of you can come. Maybe all of you can come. That would be a party. So I began to wonder why is it if in the early church communion was more like a dinner party, what's happened? Now we don't know all that's happened in the early church around communion, but we do, do, we do, do know four things. Four things were present in communion and the early church. The first thing was it was very inclusive. Everybody was invited. You know, in the early, uh, in the Greco-Roman uh, banqueting rules, social customs of the day, uh, people always ate and they were segregated in just about every meal. The rich would come and, and they would go into the inner courts of the home. And then the servants would serve them and they would eat later on outside of those areas, in, in larger rooms outside. But the inner sanctum was where the wealthy ate. And sometimes people didn't eat at all because there was a lot of poverty in those days in the early church. And so that's how Greco-Roman banqueting law really worked. People were separated by, by economic status. Women never ate with men, so they were separated by gender. And they were separated in all kinds of ways. So you can imagine how amazing and earth-shaking and as Jesus came and turned the tables, quite literally. In the early church, everyone was welcome at the table. Everyone of every economic status, every age, every gender, every race was welcome to one table. The second thing was that they were always celebrating, as I said before. Only during Holy Week did they focus on the death of Christ, as they said these words of institution that are recorded in all of the Gospels and in 1 Corinthians, that, which you heard just now. They would, we would have a meal, a whole meal, not just a wafer and a dip, but they had a whole meal that they would share together first, and then they would have communion. And all were welcome to that table. Now that whole meal thing is interesting because as we read in the Gospels and as we read in this First Corinthians, we see in that scripture that they ate supper first. Jesus said after the supper, he took the bread and then the cup. 
So communion was quite a big thing after a long meal. And then they would break it and they would have the communion together. The other thing that they shared together was that they enjoyed conversation. It wasn't a silent trek down the aisle to share a silent communion, but they would share their lives together and they would laugh and they would giggle together and they would share their lives in a, a wonderful way. And they would grow together and they would pray together as they offered each other support. So if communion was like this in the early church, what happens? How is it that the church has been so divided about communion? If we go to other denominations, there are denominations who say only these people can take communion. If we go to other churches, we know that people sometimes are, are told to wait. And, and communion is pretty somber. I remember in my first, in my first church in Woodbury, there was a, a man that came up to me one Sunday and he said, I'm a visitor and I've been searching for a church because I grew up Catholic and I've been away from the church for many years because I had a divorce in my family. I'm, I'm divorced. And he said, the church has not welcomed me to the table unless I get an annulment. And some of you know this tradition in the Catholic church and they have reasons for that and I'm not putting the Catholic church down but he had been away from the church because he had been hurt and excluded. On that Sunday, he heard me consecrate the elements using the words of institution, and at the end of the, at the, end of the words of institution, there's an invitation. And we always say this in the United Methodist Church, we serve communion always at an open table, which means everyone is welcome at our table. Every single person is welcome to come and share in the blessings of this holy meal. And he said, I began to cry and the tears began to roll down my cheeks because I knew I had found my church. All are welcome. But communion has changed over the years and there, there are problems with it in churches and different denominations and we argue about communion. Did the bread and the wine really turn into the body and blood of Jesus or is it, is it a symbol? And we argue about all these things and wouldn't it be great if we could just come back to the basics of what communion was supposed to be about that we share in the remembrance of Jesus and we remember that we are fortified and enriched for a new life. This passage we read today, that Glenna read so well this morning, is about a church in Corinth where there were divisions like there are divisions in the church today. But these divisions were just a little bit different. You see what was happening, what Paul is addressing in the, in the early church is that um, there are two ways to do communion in the early church and the first one was like a potluck. People would bring all kinds of food and they would share the food and the supper first and then they would have the communion. And that went pretty well. But then there was also one called the paternal method. And that would mean that a, a, a rich or wealthy person in the congregation would say, I want to open up my large house and the whole congregation can come over for a party. And we'll, I'll provide all the food, I'll provide everything that's needed, and then you all come. And we'll share in life together and we'll share the, the Lord's Supper together. But what was happening in the church of Corinth, which was experiencing all kinds of divisions about all kinds of things, is that, that some would come early in the afternoon because they didn't have to work. They had the means to just come. And some of them were wealthy and didn't have to work. And, 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 they, they, and those who did work but could get off at five, they were there early. And they began to eat all the food. And so by the time the day laborers came, not only was all the food gone, but everyone was drunk. We have not seen this at Hennepin. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so Paul is addressing a situation in the church that was tearing them apart. And I wonder, I wonder what is tearing us apart and keeping all the people from coming to the table today. This summer we're going to try to offer summer brunch. And I was excited about the possibility that we might be able to extend brunch all year long. Wouldn't that be great? Bacon all summer. Just say it. And if we have enough volunteers, we're going to be able to offer that. And someone came up to me when they heard that we're contemplating doing summer brunch. And they said, well, you know, Judy, that means that the homeless are going to come. Because it's summer and it's warm and they're back. They're back in town from warm places. They've come and they're in the neighborhood again. 
And I said, yes, isn't it great? Isn't it great that anyone who comes to Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church, anyone who is hungry spiritually, physically, or any, in any other way, that all are welcome to the table? Isn't that great? Yes. Friends, that's just the kind of radical hospitality that Jesus had in mind when he took the bread and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and take it and eat all this. And remember me. Remember my radical hospitality. Remember who I am and whose you are. Remember that I came to give new life to all people no matter who you are or where you've been or where you're going. The United Methodist Church is in a time of discernment. It has been 40 years since words were put in our book of discipline that exclude gay and lesbian persons, transgender persons. And we have been struggling mightily over what does this mean for the body of Christ to be so divided over this issue. And let me tell you, this is not an issue. These are people, persons who are hurting, persons who have been hurt by the church and are yearning to be a part of a community like ours where they know each and every time when they walk through the doors that not only will they be tolerated, they will be blessed. And people will say to you, you are a child of God. I am a child of God. We sit at the same table. I don't know how it's going to come out. The bishops received the, the recommendations from the commission, and there were two recommendations of way forward so that we could end the struggle and move on to really enhance and embrace our mission to welcome all people, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We have work to do in the world, my friends. It won't be easy as we head into the special session of General Conference in 2019. I will lead the delegation. It will be difficult. There will be difficult conversations. There may be words that are unkind, that are spoken from the mics. And so this morning, as I think about this, and as you think about this, and as we prepare for this important time in our church, in the United Methodist Church, we must remember Jesus' words that all are welcome to the table. I'm going to ask you to do something very specific. I'm asking you this day that you will make an effort to pray for the United Methodist Church each and every day as we head into a special conference in February 2019. I'm asking that you will pray that we might be one church. I'm asking that you will pray that we will welcome all who come to our doors, that we will truly have open hearts, open minds, and open doors as we welcome people as Jesus would. I pray that we will be able to change our book of discipline so that each person knows that they are welcome beyond a shadow of a doubt. It won't be easy. There will be some churches who will leave our denomination because they cannot say that we are that open. I pray that this church will continue to be the church it has always been, welcoming each person to the table of our Lord with open hearts and open arms. As I think about what Jesus did in his life, he sacrificed, he suffered, for our sake, so that we might know that love will always win. Love will always have the last word if we seek to be open to the grace and wisdom of God who loved us first and who loves us best. May we experience this day at the table of our Lord a redemptive moment as we confess our sin as we lay it before God, and as we come knowing that we are forgiven people who are serving a risen Lord. This morning I want you to try something. You'll feel uncomfortable. You'll say, why do we have to do this? I would like for you to try something. 
I'd like you to be like the early church. I'd like you to come together with joy. As we come up for the table, feel free to come with joy. <laughs> feel free to talk with your neighbors and just whisper and say, how can I pray for you this week? Come forward so that we might truly be one body, one church that opens our hearts up to the redeeming and healing love of Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. Let's eat.